Story 1. Many years ago, I worked at a now-closed convenience store and gas station in the Midwest. I was initially hesitant to take the job because convenience stores are often associated with robberies. However, the store was new, well-lit, clean, and located on a busy road. Plus, I needed a second job quickly since university is expensive, and a girl has to eat ramen and peanut butter can only get you so far. After starting the job, I soon realized my fears about being robbed were unfounded. My store was a regular hangout for local law enforcement. The city police, county sheriff, and even detectives stopped by multiple times a day. They'd chat with the staff or grab a snack on their way to work. This would come into play later. While I didn't have to worry about robberies and enjoyed the job overall, there was one major annoyance, a co-worker named Branson. He was in his early 20s, well-spoken, and intelligent, but he always acted like he knew everything. No matter what you were talking about, he had to prove he knew more, even about your personal experiences. For instance, he once tried to tell me about the cafeteria in the hospital where my mother worked when I was a child, as if he knew more about it than I did. As if being a no-it-all wasn't enough. Branson was also a tattletale. If you didn't stock the coolers before he arrived, he'd tattle. If the bathrooms weren't cleaned before his shift, he'd tattle. If there wasn't fresh coffee, he'd tattle. It didn't matter how minor or trivial the issue was he'd always run to management. The managers were just as annoyed with him as the rest of us cashiers. One time, he nearly got me fired by falsely claiming that I allowed a friend to steal from the store. Fortunately, our store was full of cameras, and after I pleaded with the manager to check the footage, it proved that Branson was either completely wrong or lying just to amuse himself. Of course, Branson never apologized because, in his mind, he was never wrong. One day, the store was filled with law enforcement officers, as usual two sheriffs and four or five city cops. It was shift change, and my co-worker and I were getting ready to hand off our shift to Branson. Since there were no other customers, we were all standing around chatting. The sheriff's supervisor, Bucky, was there too. Bucky was a genuinely kind person the kind of guy who would give you the shirt off his back if he thought you needed it. While I was talking with some of the other officers, Bucky was having a conversation with Branson. I wasn't paying much attention until things started to take a turn. Branson, true to form, started arguing with Bucky, insisting that Bucky was wrong about something. Then, he went further, suggesting that Bucky didn't have the education that Branson had, implying that it was natural for Branson to know more. Bucky didn't argue. Instead, he just smiled and removed himself from the conversation, walking over to me. He caught my eye and motioned for me to come over. When I did, he quietly asked me for Branson's last name. Not seeing any harm in it, I told him. Bucky thanked me and wandered off into the store. A few minutes later, Bucky returned with a puzzled look on his face and asked Branson, Hey, buddy, what was your name again? Branson, sounding slightly annoyed, repeated his name. Bucky walked off again but soon returned with a big grin on his face. He motioned for Branson to come out from behind the counter. Your name is Branson last name, right? Bucky asked, his grin widening. Branson confirmed it, and Bucky reached for the handcuffs on his belt. I'm so happy to hear that because there's a warrant out for your arrest, and I'm going to have to take you in. I'll need you to turn around and put your hands behind your back. At that moment, all conversation in the store came to a halt. My co-worker and I exchanged shocked glances, and those expressions quickly turned to pure delight as Branson was handcuffed and led out of the store. I never saw Branson again, but later that evening, Bucky returned to apologize for making me stay late. I told him I didn't mind it was worth it for the show. I would have gladly stayed late again just to watch Branson sabotage himself. Life tip, if you have a warrant out for your arrest, it's probably not a good idea to annoy a police officer. Story 2 While I did press charges on my mother for stalking me and trying to frame me as a distributor of illicit substances, I didn't want to spend much time in court because that meant being near her. So the events I'm about to describe are half from me, and half from my dad. They probably aren't very accurate. It was five years ago. 
so please don't criticize me harshly if anything sounds off. It's something I've mostly tried to put behind me. To start off with, my dad actually didn't know that my troubled mother had taken a flight to my state to stalk me. She claimed to him that she was just going to take a small vacation away from everyone for her own mental health, and never said where she was going. And my poor dad didn't know what she was about to do, or he'd have warned me. My mother then spent several days secretly following me and my girlfriend around with her smartphone. She used the spare key we kept hidden inside of a fake rock to get into the house we were living in at the time. She then photographed everything she could. Then after she returned home, my dad said she looked really smug about something. He described it as the kind of look someone has when they think they've won, and she seemed unusually happy and giddy until police came and arrested her on Christmas. Dad said she was bawling her eyes out and saying she didn't do anything wrong as she was being carted out by the cops. The evidence against her was clear. All of the photos were found on her phone and my dad quickly realized what she'd done. The call my mother made to claim I was selling illicit substances she even made from her own smartphone. The call was recorded and was very much traced back to her phone quite easily. When my mother was confronted with the evidence, my dad said she just started crying and begging, and when she refused to get up from the table, the police had to move her. Dad said she just totally went limp and refused to cooperate. No one bailed her out of jail either. She had to use her own money to get herself out. Dad said she wanted to call me to beg, but I guess in a rare moment of clarity, she figured out there was no way I'd bail her out after what she did so she spent a while locked up before finally using her own money to get out. She didn't try to run. In fact, she firmly believed herself to be justified in what she'd done and felt like she could sway a judge to her point of view. Her lawyer advised her to just plead guilty, so she fired him and said she'd represent herself. Well, that went about as well as you can imagine. She was in court faster than I thought and my girlfriend and I had to fly over to testify against my mother. But I only stayed as long as they needed me, and I was on the first flight I could get back. But while I was there, my mother seemed to stare at me almost constantly. The stares ranged from her creepy pleading look to absolute rage. When my mother took the stand, she gave a speech about why she believed she was right. I needed to be taught a lesson for refusing to come home and for putting some girl before her because she should have been the only woman I'd ever need. She also tried to keep staring at me the entire time she was making this speech, but the judge repeatedly told her not to do that. I left before the sentencing. The judge believed my mother to be mentally unwell, but when he stated this, she went off on him that she was completely sane. Of course, that just made her look more unstable. She said she was just a mother looking out for her son, and did what she had to do to teach me a lesson. My dad spoke up and said if she was really looking out for me, she wouldn't have tried to make her own son into her second husband or frame me for stuff I didn't do just for refusing her. That made her go off on him, and guards had to keep them apart. The judge was originally going to be more lenient on my mother, but decided she needed some real time behind bars and sentenced her to two years in prison with three years probation. When she was sentenced, my mother went full toddler and had a tantrum of pounding her fists and crying like a baby. She had to be carried out of the courtroom because she refused to cooperate again. My dad described the next two years without her there as being absolute bliss and made up his mind that he'd be ready to divorce her as soon as she was out, and I mean giving her the papers on the very day she came home, and that was the same day he left that house for good. He owns an Airstream trailer and parked it at a friend's house. From there, he spent months fighting my troubled mother in the divorce. That's when more concerning stuff about her came out. My dad eventually won and moved to my state with his trailer as soon as he could. Aside from a few rare phone calls from her, I've not associated with my mother again, and neither has my dad. He spent some time just living as a retired man on the coast, but then decided to get a simple part-time job in a fish cannery because he was bored. He says it pays the bills, and he's made a lot of friends. He's happy, and I'm happy he's happy. I visit him on weekends when I can. My mother, though, I've not spoken a word to her in two years. 
any number she ever used to call me with after court was blocked. I am done with her. Edit. I forgot to mention. When I took the stand against my mother, I spilled my guts on all the concerning stuff she did to me. All the stuff from my first post came out and I had to make myself stop. Everyone but my mother in the courtroom was openly disgusted, and my mother just started ugly crying the moment all eyes were on her. The part where I told everyone she'd called my girlfriend an interloping witch to some imaginary special bond, she perceived us having really struck a nerve as I became furious just speaking of it. My mother defended herself and tried to say we did have that inappropriate bond, but I stated that was all in her head and always was. That made her have a breakdown and court had to be ended for the day soon after that. I wasn't needed there anymore and flew home with my girlfriend that very night. Story 3 A little backstory to start. I own several collector cars and drive them almost every day when the weather permits. The car I was driving today was my Toyota Chaser, which I imported from Japan and modified into a drift car. For context, I'm one of the long-term sufferers of post-COVID symptoms, which means that for the past year, I've dealt with fatigue, shortness of breath, and several other ongoing health issues. Because of this condition, I was granted a handicapped parking permit. On my way home, my wife called and asked if I could pick up a few things for dinner. Naturally, I agreed. I stopped at a shopping center close to my home and noticed two available handicapped parking spaces. I parked in the one farther from the store and went in to pick up the groceries, using my cane for support. When I exited the store, I saw a police car parked in front of my vehicle, with my parking permit clearly hanging in the window. A disgruntled person was talking to the officer. Using the cart for balance, I approached and asked, Is everything okay here? The entitled person immediately responded, Who do you think you are parking in a handicapped spot? No disabled person would drive a car like this. You're faking it, and you probably made that permit yourself. The officer finally spoke up and said, Ma'am, the permit and the vehicle's registration match the same name. Sir, may I see your driver's license? I handed him my license and said, No problem, officer. Have a nice afternoon. The entitled person, however, wasn't satisfied and protested. What? You can't just let him go. Look at this junk car. She was referring to my car. The officer calmly replied, Ma'am, even if this gentleman didn't have the right to park here, we'd issue a ticket, not tow the vehicle. The entitled person demanded to speak to a supervisor, but the officer declined her request. She continued making a scene, holding her cell phone, but the supervisor wasn't called. The officer bid us both a good day, and the entitled person eventually walked off, clearly frustrated. The officer and I shared an awkward laugh before he got back into his car. As he drove away, I began loading my groceries into the back seat of my car. My car has a custom hood from Sabin Carbon, which cost me three dollars and includes custom drilling for the hood exit exhaust. As I finished putting the groceries in, I heard a loud banging noise. Looking up, I saw the same entitled woman, now wielding a hammer, repeatedly hitting the hood of my car. She smashed the headlights and damaged the front bumper. Before I could stop her, she managed to completely crack the custom hood, splintering it from end to end. In defense, I pushed her away hard enough that she fell onto her back and rolled over, ending up on her stomach. She stood up, screaming, You're a monster! A store employee and two customers witnessed the entire scene and came rushing over. Realizing she was outmatched, the entitled person called the police again. I couldn't hear much of her conversation, but I was nervous about the possibility of being charged with assault. Less than five minutes later, the same officer arrived, this time with two additional police units. He instructed me to sit down, and I complied, feeling extremely anxious. He handcuffed me while the entitled person continued yelling about how I had assaulted her. The officer noticed the damage to my car and asked me what had happened. I explained that the woman had just attacked my car with a hammer after he had left. The entitled person denied this, claiming that she only hit the hood once because she had missed hitting me. Fortunately, 
I remembered that my car was equipped with a dash cam that automatically records when motion is detected. I told the officer about the dash cam and mentioned that I could pull up the footage on my phone. He uncuffed me as the entitled person continued shouting that I should be arrested, realizing she was in serious trouble. The dash cam footage showed everything, including the moment when she tried to swing the hammer at me across the parking lot, which I hadn't even noticed at the time. The officer immediately handcuffed her, and she resisted, even going so far as to spit on one of the other officers. I press charges, and the entitled person is now facing four counts, vandalism, felony assault, assault on a police officer, and resisting arrest. The officer allowed me to drive my damaged car home, which was only about two miles away, while he followed me to make sure everything was fine. My car is now sitting in the garage as I wait on hold with my insurance agent, preparing to file a claim. I also plan to file a civil suit against the entitled person for the damage she caused. Story 4 A few things to note. First, I am a security officer with a private investigator certification, which allows me to take on private investigator cases as long as they don't interfere with local police investigations. Any crimes that I witness must be reported to the police immediately so they can make an arrest. Private investigator cases come from a few sources. Sometimes, local police contract us for what's referred to as spotter work. In these instances, we are brought onto active, wide area investigations to perform reconnaissance, observing but not interacting with anything related to the case. Essentially, we act as an extra pair of eyes. In other situations, we are involved in surveillance operations, where we follow low-profile individuals and report their daily activities. These operations are completely confidential. We also receive client contracts, often from corporations, that hire our personal investigations unit to monitor employees' daily activities while on the job. The goal is to determine if there's any indication that an employee is engaging in illegal activity and to report any reasonable proof of wrongdoing. Our job is to gather evidence to establish guilt or innocence. These investigations aren't confidential, but we typically sign non-disclosure agreements. Finally, there are personal contracts these occur when an individual hires a private investigator, usually for something like verifying if a spouse is cheating or locating a lost family member. In these cases, there is no formal disclosure agreement unless the client creates one. Most don't, but we maintain confidentiality out of professional courtesy. Now that I've explained the job, let me tell you what happened. About three years ago, I was hired for a personal contract. The client, a very wealthy but obnoxious individual, believed his wife was cheating on him with multiple people. He wanted solid proof to start the divorce process. He hired my team when I say, my team, I mean the five-person unit I work with under a six-month contract and agreed to pay a large sum upon completion. We set up surveillance cameras all over his massive house and in his wife's car, with his permission. We also had at least one team member tailing her at all times. Day in and day out, we observed their lives. In this line of work, you either become detached or get emotionally invested, like watching a soap opera. As we monitored the situation, it quickly became clear that the wife was a wonderful person. She volunteered at a soup kitchen, helped at a children's hospital, and participated in local church food drives. In contrast, the husband was the real problem we frequently caught him bringing other women into the house, sometimes two or three in one day, and that was just what we recorded at the house. By the time we reached the four-month mark, we had gathered enough evidence to present our findings. During our six-hour debriefing session, complete with video and audio, we showed the client that his wife had done nothing wrong, aside from a speeding ticket and a few instances of double parking. After we concluded, he looked bewildered and asked, so you didn't catch her cheating. What was the point of hiring you? My boss, the captain, gave him a stern look the most serious and commanding expression I'd ever seen on him and replied, You hired us to investigate your wife. Are you upset that your wife is honest and faithful? Visibly irritated, the client stood up to leave, but my captain said, 
there are still two months left on the contract. We'll continue tailing her and meet again at the end for any updates. The client responded, Don't bother. This is over. Come and collect your equipment when she's not home. So, a week later, we did just that. Now, here's some food for thought. When contracts like this are created, a small portion is paid up front as a commission fee, and the remainder is paid at the end of the contract term. In this case, the contract was for six months. The commission is split among the investigators as a bonus, while the salary comes from the company to cover us until the contract ends. Once the client pays the final amount, it's divided between the investigators and the office. It's good money when everything works out. Fast forward to the next payday after the contract officially ended. My team received a call from the office about an emergency meeting regarding our last contract. When we arrived, we found out that the client had pulled the funding and refused to pay us for the work we completed. While we did get paid, we missed out on the completion bonus. Needless to say, we were frustrated. Over lunch, we brainstormed ways to get back at him, and eventually, we remembered the footage of his indiscretions. Initially, we considered blackmail, but that's not our style, we're better than that. Then I thought of his wife, so I reached out to her. I arranged to meet with her, explained everything, and showed her the footage. She cried for about half an hour. I could tell her world was falling apart. It was heart-wrenching. I advised her to get a lawyer and gave her all the evidence we had collected, along with my business card. Six months later, I was called into court. My company was suing the client for fraud, breach of contract, and unpaid dues. We won the case easily, as his lawyer's argument was that we failed to deliver the results he wanted. However, we weren't hired to deliver a specific outcome. We were hired to observe and report. In the end, we got paid. The wife later contacted me to thank me for the evidence. She filed for divorce, and thanks to the proof we provided, she got almost everything – the house, both cars, and a large cash settlement. The moral of the story, don't try to cheat people whose job is to gather evidence. Update as of June 17, 2019. Several people asked about the wife, so I reached out to her, and we agreed to meet. Yesterday, we got together at a local coffee shop and I met her new husband. She now has two daughters, both adorable and very well behaved, and is pregnant with a boy. She's been remarried for nearly two years. Over coffee, she shared a story about her own small act of revenge. After her divorce, the husband's family demanded that she sell the house, which they claimed was an ancestral home. They initially offered her $250,000. However, a realtor valued the property at close to $1.5 million. Over the next few months, the family continued pressuring her to sell. Eventually, she told them that the house was worth $5 million, but out of respect, she'd sell it to them for a discounted price of $3.5 million. They paid in cash the very next day. As we finished our chat, she pulled out her wallet. I thought she was about to give me money so I raised my hand to stop her. Instead, she handed me my old business card. She explained that she had tried to reach me a year ago to thank me, but couldn't because the number was disconnected. She asked if I could update my contact information because she wanted to keep me in her back pocket, just in case. I updated my details, and she invited me and my family to dinner at their home on Friday. To top it all off, this morning, I received a call from my boss who was thrilled to tell me that we have a new client offering a five-year contract. The client, the wife's new husband, who is a magistrate. He got approval for a contract with our company, with the condition that I oversee the team as the new captain. This means we'll be handling jobs directly from the court. Thanks to everyone who asked me to check on her. I went for a coffee chat and ended up securing a high-profile, well-paying client. Story 5. I'll list the main characters along with their ages at the time. There's me 19, Brit 24, Ash 25, and Duncan 20. Duncan doesn't enter the story until later, but I moved in with Brit and Ash in a roommate situation around June 2021. We were good friends, and I needed to get myself and my baby one-year-old girl out of a bad situation. The rent and utilities were affordable, 
and we agreed to split food and drinks. We each had our chores on specific days. It was like our own little family. From the beginning, I had a bad feeling about Brit. She was clingy, quick to anger, and often threatened violence when upset. However, I knew she had a personality disorder and didn't think she'd actually hurt anyone. Once I moved in, I realized I was wrong. Brit and Ash would argue constantly, with screaming matches at least twice a week. Brit would get physically violent, and I always ended up comforting and cleaning up after Ash. It was stressful for both me and the baby. I hardly slept, which affected my ability to breastfeed. Overall, it was not a good situation. At the time, I was using government assistance to buy food. The benefits were enough for one adult and one infant toddler. I initially bought a decent amount of food, ensuring my baby had everything she needed and grabbing some snacks for everyone. We all bought food separately, but we were allowed to share it. I did the cooking, and we would always eat dinner together. Britt cleaned, and Ash left for work. However, Britt eventually stopped cleaning, leaving the task to me because she felt too overwhelmed to do the dishes. Things escalated when they started asking for my food assistance card for gas station runs, and then they took it from my wallet without asking. Sometimes, they hoarded what they bought with it in their bedroom. Meanwhile, Britt became more aggressive, excluding me from conversations in the living room and piling even more housework on me. Britt started messing with my belongings shortly after Duncan moved in. Duncan was nice, a bit reserved, but I enjoyed spending time with him. He made an effort to include me in activities, which Britt didn't like. She became passive-aggressive, pouring out my soda if I left it on the counter while tending to the baby. She also took my laptop from the kitchen and threw it on my bed. One day, I came home to find my expensive breast pumping equipment and lactation supplements dumped on the floor. When I confronted her, she said, It's gross that guests have to see that stuff. When my food assistance card declined just a week after being recharged, I knew I needed to move out. I still had my old apartment and was paying for it, so I planned to move back within a week or two. I started packing and preparing for the move. Britt was furious, refusing to talk to me, and even told Ash that I said they couldn't talk to or touch my baby. I never said that I'm not that kind of person. Ash asked me about it, and I explained the truth. We decided to keep things civil and remain friends. We sat together, sharing funny TikTok videos, until a text from Brit popped up on Ash's screen. Thanks a lot, Ash. Now the witch will try to stay. That was the last straw. I decided to move immediately. I called my mother and a few friends, and I planned to take everything I had bought with my money. I took both of my TVs, most of the cookware and cutlery, the coffee table, the end table, the outdoor chairs, and all the organizers in the bathroom down to the plunger. I also took most of the food from the fridge and cabinets. The bedroom and living room were left bare, as I had purchased most of the daker. I even took half the blankets in the house, as I tend to get cold easily. Even though I had paid for the entire month, I didn't ask for a refund for the remaining half, they had probably already spent it on substances. Nothing against them, I partake as well but they were constantly using. I packed up all my things into multiple vehicles and left. Afterward, I didn't hear from them, except for a string of angry texts threatening to call Child Protective Services and lie about me if I didn't pay for another month. They were going to be evicted. As far as I know, they never followed through. What brought all this back to mind was a few weeks ago when Duncan messaged me on Facebook. He asked how I was doing, and I asked the same. He told me that he had moved away from the roommates. He said he finally understood why I left, as the fighting had gotten worse and the house had fallen into disarray. They never cleaned, and Duncan couldn't handle it all on his own, which prevented him from moving his toddler in with him. Britt became jealous of his friendship with Ash and started lashing out at him. He couldn't take it any more and left just as I had. As far as I know, Ash lost her job and Britt now works at a piercing shop. They are living off of Ash's wealthy father, but their relationship is on the verge of collapse. Honestly, I can't say I feel sorry for them. Story 6 When I was 13, I was wandering around a retail store 
Let's call it bullseye for this story. Waiting for my mom to finish picking out some tennis shoes, I was aimlessly browsing the music section, looking at CDs, when a woman, who seemed to be in her late forties, came stomping up to me. She had five kids swarming around her, ranging from about three to ten years old, plus a baby in her arms. I had no idea what she was saying at first because her yelling sounded more like screeching. As she got closer, she tried to hand the baby to me. Completely confused, I backed away with my hands up like she was trying to give me something dangerous. Then, she started screaming for a manager. I need a manager, she yelled, until a couple of employees walked up to us. At this point, she got a smug look on her face and pointed directly at me as if she were accusing me of a serious crime. This employee almost made me drop my baby, she screeched. I tried to drop my children off for childcare, and she refused to take my baby and my kids. There's no sign that says how many kids you can drop off, so I won't be discriminated against just because I have a lot of beautiful children. I stood there with my jaw practically on the floor. I was 13, in the middle of my MO phase, clearly not dressed as an employee, and in the music section of all places. What about me looked like I worked in childcare at a retail store. The employees seemed just as baffled. Their expressions ranged from confused to barely holding back laughter. They stood in silence for a few seconds before the woman started shouting again, threatening to sue and insisting I was supposed to be in the childcare area. She ranted about how unprofessional I looked and how she didn't want her kids being watched by someone who looked like a devil worshipper. She even dragged her husband and church into it, threatening more action. Finally, the manager spoke up, explaining that I didn't work there and, in fact, the store didn't offer any childcare services. That only made her angrier, and she accused them of lying. I realized what had happened and explained it to the manager. This store had a small arcade room near the entrance, next to the snack counter where they sold popcorn and pretzels. The woman had been dropping her kids off in the arcade room and expected the nearby employee to watch them while she shopped. The employee was only near the arcade because it was right by the front door. The room was tiny, with only about four games, so I had no idea how all her kids fit in there. This was her first time back at the store since having her baby, and apparently she thought this was a childcare service. You'd think she'd be embarrassed once the truth came out, but nope, she doubled down. She started screaming that I had abandoned the children I was supposed to be watching and that the manager was covering for me. She threatened to call the police and report both me and the store for child endangerment. She was convinced I would be fired. The manager, clearly frustrated at this point, asked her to follow him so they could resolve the situation. She refused at first, saying she wanted to be there when I was fired. But the manager finally lost his patience and yelled, Ma'am, she does not work here, leave her alone. She eventually followed him, though not without more grumbling. After she left, the other employees brought me up to the register and offered me a $100 gift card, along with a lot of apologies. I tried to turn it down, explaining it wasn't their fault, but they insisted. From what I could gather, the woman had said a lot of terrible things about me while ranting, though I hadn't understood much of it. They were probably worried my parents might sue. They called my mom to the front of the store to explain what had happened and gave me the gift card. My mom, however, found the entire thing hilarious. She laughed so hard that I thought she might pass out from lack of oxygen. She was especially bummed that she had missed the whole ordeal. As we were leaving, she looked at me, still dressed in my emo gear, and said, who in their right mind would try to hand their newborn to a complete stranger who has lyrics like cut my wrist and black my eyes written on their shirt? I used to buy blank shirts and scribble my favorite song lyrics on them with sharpies. I thought I was so cool back then. In the end, I don't know what happened with Mother of the Year, but the next time we went to Bullseye, there was a huge new sign by the arcade room entrance that read, Do not leave children unattended. It was about four times larger than the old sign, which said the exact same thing. One of the employees who had given me the gift card greeted me and told me that both the police and Child Protective Services had been called regarding the incident, but that's all they knew. My mom, on the other hand, 
suddenly had a reason to go to Bullseye all the time after that, clearly hoping to run into Mrs. Hey Stranger Take My Infant Again.